Welcome, friends, to this uh, special event today. It's a very important event for me. It's like the big step forward in the dream that I have had for a long time. In 1937, that's a long time back, I was 11 years old, when I heard the great master say to Julian Johnson, an American doctor who was his disciple, he said, Johnson, you are taking spirituality to the West and the axis of spirituality itself is shifting. For centuries it has been in the Far East and in the East. For centuries great masters have been born, great saints have come in India and China and these countries have not been specially interested in producing worldly wealth but they produce a lot of spiritual wealth. This axis is shifting. The axis of spirituality is shifting. And what was being needed by these countries at one time will shift to the West. And West, after having got plenty of affluence, having made worldly progress in material wealth, we look forward to the East and the East will then move to the West because the number of seekers that will be coming up now in the coming 50, 100 years, will be coming from the West. These Eastern countries like India and China, which have produced so many saints, will all begin to hanker after material wealth. And they will think that the worldly material affluence is the only thing to strive for. I have grown up with these words in my mind. In 1937, the great master also wrote two other American disciples of his who were there in the United States. And then he said in those letters that North America is ready for spirituality. You are already ready. It is only a question of explaining these teachings in your language, in your terms. And that will happen. It will happen soon. At that time, the number of people who will be seeking the spiritual truth will be very much increased. And all of us will be helping each other to the spiritual goals which have so far been achieved in the East. I read those letters also. After reading those letters and after some instructions he gave me when I was 11 years old, I knew that my destiny was to be in this country, United States, because the great master also said in another, on another occasion that when the axis of spirituality shifts to the West, Western countries will gain from the spiritual knowledge and also it will localize in a big way in the United States of America. When I heard that, I said I must go there. About the same time, I was in school and a program came to bring some selected students from Indian schools to the United States. It was sponsored by the Harvard University. Henry Kissinger who later on became Secretary of State. He was the sponsor of that movement. And he wrote a letter to me when I was 11 years old, saying that I have been selected for coming to the United States. My father protested, that's no age for one to visit the United States. It's not a nearby country. So he was at a different station. He wrote to me that this is not a good idea to go to the United States at this time. I wrote back. And he had a copy of this letter till the end of his life, in which I said, I agree with you, I will not go to the United States now, but it looks that I'll go several times later. It has a, it's a gut feeling I have, I'll go several times later. At that time, it was very difficult to travel to this country with our limited means we had. Later on, I got a fellowship to study at the very university 
from where the first offer had come. I joined Harvard University and began to know, learn the American language. I had been taught a British language. Then I began to learn American language and the American accent to some extent. But I found that I didn't understand the American language. So I could speak very limited things. I was like a robot amongst people here. They would say something to me. I wouldn't know what they said. So I would say yes. <laughs> I thought they're the simplest answer. They say, what's your name? I said, yes. <laughs> it was a very funny situation for a while. But gradually I picked up how to communicate here. And gradually I came several times after that to this country on government jobs, on other projects. Eventually I shifted here. The reason why I shifted was that I knew great master's prophecy. That the axis of spirituality itself is going to shift to the West and localize in a big way in the United States. So I came hurrying when I could after my retirement from my job in India. I hurried here to take a ringside seat on the show that was going to happen here. I am watching the show now. And I can see that that prophecy is coming true. You who are assembled here are a witness to that prophecy. You are over here are seeing something that is the fulfillment of great master's prophecy. This place is a very hallowed place. It's a very special place. When I first came here, I remembered the story of how the Dera in India, where great master worked, was found. His master, Baba Jamal Singh, he was traveling around. And when he stopped near the river, Bias, in India, a crazy fellow, was dancing there, jumping, saying, this is it, this is it. There'll be a big place here. And Baba Jamal Singh stood there. He said, this will be the place where the Dera will be. That's where the Dera stands today. It's become a very big colony, almost like a township already. And in the center of so much spiritual and emanation from masters and from people visiting from all over the world to that, to that single place where that crazy, crazy man was dancing. I was visiting Wisconsin and I set up a little industry, a small business in Chicago, near Chicago in Illinois. The governor of Wisconsin at that time was very keen to shift some of these small industries to Wisconsin. Somehow in the list that he prepared to call, my name came up and my uh, food company, All Star Foods, came up. So he called me and said, I would like to invite you to the United States and would like you to examine which place you would like to settle your business in. I would like you to shift your business, but if you don't want to shift, open an additional business in Wisconsin. I said, I'll examine all the places. So then I began to tour around here and I came to Eau Claire and traveled up north on Route 40. And we were going along the Chippewa River. And over here, a crazy man began to dance and shout, raising his arms. I said, this is it. Just copycat. See? <laughs> <laughs> this is the very place where we were. This is the same river, Chippewa River, flowing next to us. And we were able to then say, this is going to be the place. And the crazy man, of course, is a friend of ours. But at that time, he turned crazy, just to give me a hint. So I'm happy about it. Today we have broken ground here. That's a great beginning of the conference center that we are going to set up here. It will be a very good conference center. A lot of great spiritual activity will take place by several masters. Several masters to come will have a chance to work here. This will be a place which will not be too big enough for the people who will be coming here. This is the beginning. This dome structure that they are making over here is going to be useful for a few years. After that, we'll have to move on to a larger facility. I am very happy that my friend Hugh McCaffrey sitting here, he has been my guardian angel for many years. And he can himself tell you the story how he became my guardian angel by sheer coincidence, accident, and his 
and my good fortune that we became friends. And he moved here, waiting for this day to come. He got over 150 acres of land here, right across from this road here. And he said to me, this land is dedicated for the purpose for which you have come here. And he said, I'm waiting for the day when that can happen. As it happens, many friends turned up as if from nowhere, which always happens. And one of the friends from Arkansas, who was thinking Arkansas will be a great place for a spiritual center, he came over here and he saw this place. He was attracted to it. He talked to Hugh McCaffrey and Hugh McCaffrey sold his entire land to Gilbert with the understanding Gilbert is going to use the entire land for the purpose for which we are assembled here. It's a big dedication. The entire money that Hugh McCaffrey received, he turned over to his brother who had some interest in this land so that the land now totally belongs to Gilbert Garrett who was dedicated that the entire land will be used for the purpose of the Institute for Study of Human Awareness that is managing the affairs in which I am doing my work for the great master. So this was a strange series of events that has happened. He was very happy. He was happy that his dream has been fulfilled. I am happy half of my dream has been fulfilled. And I am looking forward to the rest of the dream being fulfilled. Then we have this place ready and we are going to use it. In the Dera, they built a small place. When I was very young, we used to go to the Bandara. Baba Jamal Singh's Bandara on 29th of December every year. The great master used to go into his little hut inside. Twice he took me inside with him, which was very rare for him to take anybody inside. He took me inside. That's the only time I saw tears in his eyes. That's the only time I saw remembering his master, that he had tears in his eyes, that he could see that the master had given him everything. And that's the day where he celebrated the Bandara of Baba Jamal Singh. And during those days at Bandara, a large crowd of people used to come. Numbers 200. In normal monthly satsangs, the number was about 20. So from 200, it began to grow. And by the time he passed away in his physical body, in 1948, the number had grown to about 400,000 attending the Bandara. So from 200, it went up to 400,000. I don't see any reason why the number will not grow over here, maybe even larger. But when the number grows too big, there's a danger that the spiritual teaching turns into a religion, that people who are involved in managing large groups, they get into internal politics. And this has always happened. When you look at the history of all the great mystics who have come and where when they established their work after they left when the organization grew large, it turned into rituals and ceremonies and took the shape of religions. This has always happened. So therefore, I am very happy that we are a small family now and we can take full advantage of this fact that I know each one of you personally. This is not possible when there are millions of people around. So that is why we should take full advantage of the present opportunity that we can exchange our ideas, exchange our experiences while the time is still right. Then an organization becomes too big. Such things are not possible, except for an inner core of people, which always stays there. But the fringe people all go into list B of the perfect living master's list that he brings with us. So that is why I say that those of you who are here today are very fortunate. I am very fortunate to be with you because you are so fortunate. I feel very happy that I am here and you have asked me to break ground here to set up the first part of our project here, which is going to be a dome. When the small satsangar, the place where the discourses of great master were held, was a very small place. Even 200 could not be accommodated. So he said, let's make a bigger place. So a bigger place came up and the small place was used for initiations only. And a larger place took a lot of time to make. It was a larger satsangha and it was supposed to accommodate over a thousand people, two thousand people. At that time, where they were coming uh, close to ten thousand people, when he said this would not be enough even. When the big satsangha came up, I worked for that also as 
I was young. There was a Mastana ji from Balochistan. We used to do seva together. And we used to, I used to carry one brick, brick on my head. He used to carry a basket of bricks. But that was equal, we are considered equal seva. In great master's eyes, even if you picked up a little sword, it was equal seva to that who's carrying a big bag. Because seva is not what you carry. Seva is with what heart, with what intention you do that seva. If you do seva without expecting reward, you get the best rewards. If you do seva for reward, you may get that reward. But if you do seva without expecting reward, you get much more than what you expect. So that is why great master used to say that seva or service is equivalent to meditation because it purifies your mind, it controls your mind, it reduces your ego in a way sometimes meditation can run to. We used to have people working on Mitti Seva, or Earth Seva, Dirt Seva, who were millionaires, billionaires, and those who were working uh, as ordinary laymen, poor people, they all worked together. You could not even see the distinction between them. Once a colonel of the army here came to the Dera to get initiated, and he first, he was in the Air Force, and he used to fly in an Air Force plane because he couldn't afford the fare. But when he used to fly, he used to fly over river Bees, B-E-A-S. He never knew this is the Bihar River. So every time he missed. Then one time he didn't miss, he realized it's pronounced Bihar. So then he was able to stop in Amritsar and drive to the Dera. And he had a suitcase with him. And when he reached the suitcase, he was seeing people carrying dirt and working there. He asked one of the guys, hey, come here. Can you carry my bag? I'll give you a good tip. The guy said, certainly, sir, I'll help you. So, oh, you speak English too? He said, yes, sir, I know English. So he took that man, uh, colonel's bag, took it to the guest house where he had a reservation. And then he said to the guy who brought the bag, here's a dollar. This is an American dollar. It's much more valuable than an Indian rupee. He said, sir, I don't take any tips. No, no, take it. It's worth it. It'll help you. He said, no, sir, I don't take tips at all. We are doing seva here. So I did it out of service for you and for my master. In the evening, he saw the same man dressed up in a nice suit in a party with the great ma with the, uh, with the master. And he, he said, are you the same man who brought my bag? He said, yes, sir, I'm the same man. Then he found he was a multi-billionaire having several industries in India. <laughs> but at that time, one cannot recognize. The, all, the whole point is that in Seva, we actually feel we are all equal. Otherwise, we all stand in our own station. We all stand with our own ego. I am so and so. I am so and so. At least in Seva, we all become equal. It's a very big thing. It's a very good way to take care of our egos. And that's why Seva is recommended all the time. I am so happy you all came to do Seva here. And therefore, I congratulate you for this opportunity you got. And I got, I did very little Seva. But according to Great Master, I will take a little bit of Earth is as good as letting a whole mountain. So I am very happy that with the help of my good guardian angel, that's where I needed a guardian angel, that with the guardian angel's help, I was able to do it. I, I would like the guardian angel to tell a story to you later on, how he became my guardian angel. It's a very interesting story. I, ha I am happy that you are all here. And I'm happy that you attended this meditation workshop. And this is this was a follow-up from the meditation workshop. We'll continue to work on our travels together. I am a co-traveler, fellow traveler with all of you. Our destination is the same. We have not set a low destination. We could have set a destination to go to heaven. We could have just set a destination to go and discover our universal mind. We could have set a destination to discover the soul and say, we'll find out who we are. We set a higher destination. We set a destination of a true home where there is only one, where all of us are actually one, from where we are all emanating, from where we are all working, from where we are getting our strength, where we are getting our souls. That's the destination we have sought for ourselves. And we, will, we have been guaranteed that we will reach those. All those initiated by great master, and in the great name of the great master, in the power of the great master, are all guaranteed to go to that destination. And of course, if we do our best, that's very good. The policy here should be, do your best and leave the rest. To whom? 
to master. Do your best. Nobody can do better than their best. So do your best and leave the rest to the master. And it works out. This is again from experience I am telling you. That if you do your best and leave the rest, master will complete the work. The rest of it automatically. Things just fall into place by themselves. When you do things with faith. When you do things with absolute faith. It's a question of a belief system. We have come from different belief systems. We have believed in different religious traditions. We have believed in other belief systems. Some of us have believed in not believing at all and being atheists and say we don't believe in God. What do you believe in? We believe in something but not God. And then when we encounter them, they say, thank God we are atheists. <laughs> That's interesting comment also. <laughs> but I have noticed that when we uh, have full faith, everything is done, whatever is destined for us automatically and without giving us a feeling we have to put an effort. Faith is such an important thing. It is faith. There was a man who came to India and he discovered that there was a sadhu who could walk on water. He said he had heard many people talking about walking on water, but they can't really do it. And he had especially heard the story of a man who was going to demonstrate that he could walk on water in, on a swimming pool, in a swimming pool in Bombay, in Mumbai. And that attracted attention of the whole world because he sold tickets. He sold tickets for that. The ringside tickets around the pool were $1,000 each. And the tickets behind were a little cheaper, 500, 200. And you had to be way up standing in the special stands uh, created for that, that you could buy something of $50. He collected millions of dollars for the show. And then he came, then he did a lot of acrobatics before. Then he said, now I'll walk, walk on water. And all the cameras, TV cameras were on him at that time. All around the pool, they paid $1,000 to put the camera there. And then as he stepped on the water, he drowned. They waited for him to come out. He never came out. He had already built a tunnel underneath from where he escaped from the other side. <laughs> With all the money. <laughs> now this uh, American guy said, I've heard these stories. This is all I, I saw, just a story. Nobody walks in water. But then they told him this uh, man lives in a very remote place, in a remote village. And people don't, people see him walking every day because he's very poor. He walks on water on a river, goes to the other side, he brings fuel wood. The forest is on the other side, he has to cut the trees and bring the wood from the other side of the river. And people in the village see him walking every day. So he went and met that man. And the man said, yes, I walk, you can walk too. It's a question of faith. If you believe you will not drown, you will not drown. That man told him, I believe I will not drown, I don't drown. He said, okay, I believe I won't drown. Will you take me with you? He said, yes, I will. Next morning, we'll walk together. Next morning, as they were near the river, he told his friend who accompanied him, he said, I believe I'll walk in water, but please give me a rope and tie it up. <laughs> so in case it doesn't work, yeah, at least you pull me out. As soon as he stepped, the other man walked away and he drowned, <laughs> they pulled him out. <laughs> So, this kind of faith doesn't work. If we say we want this and our faith is for that, in the mind we say we, can't, we don't, we are not sure if it will happen, that does not show faith. There is a book and a movie called The Secret, in which they say whatever you want, the law of attraction prevails and you will get it. But then the caveat in that is, if you believe you already got it. And they say if you don't believe you already got what you are wishing for, you won't get it. So. They got it, the authors of the book and the makers of the movie, they made millions because they believed that they will get it. But nobody else gets it. I, I meet hundreds of people reading that book and nothing happens because our faith is lacking. So when we can build up faith, how does faith come about? Faith comes by small miracles, by small things that happen in life. Faith is continuously built when little things happen, small things happen in our life and he said, this is a miracle. This could not have happened without the master. More of these things happen and the faith keeps on growing. Ultimately, we get total faith that everything is happening by the master's will and nothing will go wrong and then nothing goes wrong and everything goes right. 
it's it's a simple formula that if you have full faith, everything happens uh, for your best. And whatever your desires are all fulfilled here. Don't forget, if you have been initiated by a perfect living master and put in list A, that means you have to go back to your true home in this very life, in this physical life. Whatever desires you have, they have either to be sublimated or fulfilled before you will go. So master will accelerate all these things. Master will accelerate the fulfillment of your desires as well as the sublimation in case they can be turned over to something else. This is so necessary so that we don't have something to catch us back, to bring us, pull us back. So this life becomes very different for a person who is in list A and is going back in the same life. Then again, it depends on what your ultimate desire is. If your ultimate desire is, I don't want to come back here again, you will go back in this life, but then the life will alter and you will notice those changes in yourself. Otherwise, if you say, well, I'm on, on the spiritual path, it's all right, but I have also done worldly work, you know, so many worldly attractions, it's not easy, I'm human being, I can't control them, it's, it's all so difficult, then you are in list B. That means you're not ready for this life, but you may have to come again and complete your work. Of course, initiation by a perfect living master at least takes care of the sinchit karma, the reserve karma, and you are guaranteed that nothing will be pulled out from past lives. Next life will be made up from the events and intentions of this life. This life's karma and karma will determine your pralab for the next and no other part of previous lives, which itself makes the next life much easier. Many people over here from childhood begin to have experiences, begin to hear sounds, begin to de do these things. They wonder why, because they have done this work earlier. And this life is only based on the experience and on the life of the previous one life, not more lives. So there is a guarantee even for list B. It's not a bad idea to be on list B. Uh, you can be on list B for four lives at the most and not more than that. Well, some people don't mind coming again. I remember my dad, uh, who was a, who had great faith in the great master. He said he's God. He used to come and tell us in, in the family, I just met God. My mother got very upset with this. She complained to great master. My husband has gone crazy. She told great master, he thinks you are God. And he comes home and says, I've just met God. He should say, I met master, I met so and so. But why does he say he's met God? Nobody's met God. And uh, great master said, Kako used to call the ladies like that. He is saying it out of love. Just forget it. Just forgive him for that because he is not meaning what you think he is meaning. What he means is that he has so much love for the master that he uses those words. So then she forgot. She forgave him for saying that. But the faith of that kind led to a lot of advantage for him. And uh, I found out later on how much he gained from that faith that he had. He had an unshakable faith, which was always that Everything is happening because of my master. Master is in full control. He's taken control of my problem. He has taken control of all my events. And always having this feeling inside that this, this is happening according to master's will. And I'm living only in that will. So I have some examples in my own house from my own father. I got a lot of examples that what really counts here is faith, which, which increases automatically love and devotion. And as I said, during the meditation workshop that ultimately if you want to go beyond the mind, beyond the universal mind, beyond Trikuti, beyond Brahm, the region of Brahm, only love and devotion will take you there. There's no language to take you there. There's no space and time to create duality there. There's no such thing there. It's only love and devotion that is inherent in the totality of consciousness and in our consciousness. And that's the way by which we can go beyond the mind. So remember, faith comes from these little miracles and love and, and devotion develops automatically from faith. So we are on a very good track, all of us. I have seen. You came and took some prashad from me. I saw into your eyes and I saw the love and devotion that you already have. It has touched me that great master's prediction is already coming true in this part of the world. And when you came to me, I could see what was happening within you. And that is why I congratulate all of you that you are in very good shape at this time 
on your spiritual journey. And any help more that I, I can give, I will give you till the last breath of my life here. That's what my job is. I am on an extension in my life. According to my astrological chart, I have gone already. <laughs> I have got two extensions already. <laughs> so my life is dedicated only to this work. The rest I put up just to what they call padding of a life. I go eat, travel, or do all those things. And that is padding of my life. But the purpose of my life is simple, to carry out the work of great master in the West and especially in the United States of America. And this is going to be the center from which they will radiate so much of spiritual knowledge that people will be amazed throughout the world. We have been seeing people from the United States and the West running to India to meet gurus, to meet their masters. The reverse is going to happen. You will see people from India and China rushing to this place to come and get spiritual knowledge. It's a very big event for me. I'm sure as you grow up, many of you are very young, you'll see a lot of things happening here and you'll be able to see the great uh, place that we are sitting on right now. It's the most hallowed place, most sacred place for me. And I congratulate all of you for joining me in this break, groundbreaking ceremony today. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. We have a <coughs> saying in India, Jada bole oi kunda khole. That means if people are sleeping, somebody knocks at the door. Whoever says, who is there, get up and open the door. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever speaks up has to go. <laughs> So therefore, we'll give you the microphone. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Paul Bauer. And close to two years ago, Ishwar set up the Dara Baba Sawan Singh Building and Fundraising Committee and asked me to chair that committee. Uh, there are four other members of that committee. Um, this is the committee Ishwar set up. Uh, Jonathan Rabkin. Charlie Furlow, the other two members aren't here. Uh, Gilbert Garrett had to leave yesterday. And Ann Johnson, who isn't here, lives in California. And since then, Ishwar has been sending us all manner of talent to, to pursue this project. And uh, I, I think what I can do is just briefly summarize where we are. Ishwar early on and continuously has told us this is a dynamic project. The things change. This committee, we all need to be willing to embrace that change, uh, accept it, uh, never worry, never rush, don't worry about deadlines. And uh, we're all learning how to, how to work in that world on a project this big. The, uh, the project as of today, is that we are building a dome here and our architects have designed a wooden dome so the structure of the dome is wood uh, meaning that inside the wood will be exposed so it'll be uh, beautiful inside warm uh, it'll be 72 feet in diameter if you uh, spend a little time out here where we had the photograph later you'll see that there's a circle of flags with uh, red paint on them. That represents the outer wall of the 72-foot dome. The uh, dome, you can see these renderings that have been done by another uh, volunteer, Jeff Martin, who's a renowned landscape architect in Minneapolis. Um, his depiction of how the uh, building itself might interact with uh, the, the local environment, trees and the plants. Uh, from the outside also, you know, the vision is a very beautiful setting. We may have a basement in this dome. We expect, again, as of today, to be able to seat 400 people in the dome. Listen to Ishwar. And in the basement, we would serve food probably to 200 at a time. We would have shifts. Um, Isha owns a piece of land down there where you parked, six acres, and uh, that was um, provided by Michael LeDuc, who, who lives here and in Minneapolis, and uh, that's going to be the parking lot. So 
Um, there'll be shuttle buses, there'll be a pedestrian trail, there'll be ways to get up here, uh, drop people off. That's the essence of this project. There's also a plan uh, that Ishwar alluded to about the future. And right now our architects have drawn up a plan for a building that seats 500 to 1,000. Um, we'll see where we, we are um, when, we, when we get back to that building when this one's done. Uh, that one will have a full kitchen, a large auditorium, uh, all kinds of office space and other kinds of features. Our principal goal in both these buildings, of course, is that every seat has perfect line of sight to the master and has perfect uh, acoustics. Um, I, I think I'll just say one other thing, and that is that my personal mission on this, my principal goal, is to find ways to provide seva for everybody who, every friend of Ishwar's that exists. And so, uh, we hope there will be lots more opportunities in the future for that.